Okay, um, this is the last video for this week, and then we'll have more videos next week, and then um, then, we're, then we'll have a final exam, and we'll be done. Last time we were talking about Chapter 17, and um, one of the things that you need to bear in mind is, please don't forget, is what the Pleistocene means, which is the, the Ice Age. And what most people call the Ice Age was that period of time during the Quaternary period, Quaternary period, but specifically during the Pleistocene Epoch, which goes from 2.6 million years ago to 10,700 years ago. That was a time in Earth history that most people call the Ice Age, but was actually not the only Ice Age. It was the last Ice Age that we had. There have been many other Ice Ages, but the general term that is used when people talk about the Ice Age is the last Ice Age, which is the Pleistocene Epoch. The Pleistocene Epoch, which is 2.6 million years ago to 10,700 years ago. How do we know that the Ice Age actually even occurred? Well, it's the geologic record has all kinds of evidence for the Ice Age. And um, here you can see what um, it looks like in a place called Baffin Island, Canada, which is near the North Pole. You got glaciers there. And then we also have Ice Ages here in Alaska. Here you can see this is in northern Alaska. It's called Susitina Glacier. What is a glacier? A glacier is in a thick accumulation of ice that is there even during the summer. So another way of saying it is you get glaciers in places where you have more ice accumulate during the winter than melts during the summer. So that some of the previous years snow melt, snow I should say, is left behind and that accumulates over time so sometimes these glaciers these thick bodies of ice could be hundreds of feet thick sometimes they're just tens of feet thick but they move downhill the ice is not uh, is is controlled by gravity so the ice is going to move downhill and, and and when it moves downhill like you see here in alaska you have these rivers of ice which flow downhill. Notice that the ice is not clean. See these black streaks inside of these glaciers? These are called, by the way, valley glaciers when the ice flows through a valley like it does here. Um, the, these bodies of ice are filled with debris. Gravel, sand, silt, and clay-sized particles are carried downhill. And so the ice is like sandpaper. It wears away at the underlying rocks, smoothing it out and also making scratch marks in the rock called striations. Let's see, take a look and see what those look like. Um, let's see if I can get a picture for you here. Um, holy mother of God, I just cannot get rid of that. Okay, let's see. So, so we're gonna take a look here at what glacier, striations that look like in case you've never been to Canada you've ne you might have seen any of these things before but they're scratch marks they're left behind by the ice because the ice is, once again is filled with gravel and grit and sand and it as it moves down slope it makes these scratch marks in the rock which are called striations and these striations go down as far south as Iowa to Davenport Iowa they make it all the way to Pennsylvania. And so we know the ice, the glaciers used to move a lot farther down south. They never made it to Tennessee. We don't find these striations in Tennessee. But it was colder in Tennessee during the Pleistocene Epoch. It was colder around the world during the Pleistocene Epoch. We know that because these striations moved a lot closer to the equator. Another thing that... Um, we see with these glaciers is we see glacial till t-i-l-l -L. and glacial till are sedimentary deposits that are poorly sorted 
like this. In other words, they have all kinds of different particle sizes all mixed together. Uh, some They have some angular particles in it, so even though you see some rounded ones, they're mostly angular. So these usually get preserved as breccia, but there's also some that are conglomerates where you have rounded pebbles, but they're always poorly sorted. And the ice dumps this till out as the ice melts during the summer this debris just collects and this poorly sorted glacial till collects and that's found once again down far south as Davenport, Iowa and all the way going into Pennsylvania so the ice used to go a lot farther south than it does today. We also see uh, uh, with these valley glaciers where the ice carves out what we call glacial valleys which are also called gr glacial troughs T-R-U-G-H-S. You can read about this on the internet if you want to. But when you find U-shaped valleys like this, you know that the ice was once there. Ice carves out U-shaped valleys versus river valleys, which are V-shaped. Have you ever noticed that um, the valleys that we have here in Tennessee, they more they look more like this. They're V V shaped, and V shaped valleys are carved out by rivers. When rivers cut down into the bottom of the river channel, they make a V shaped valley. You never find valleys like this in Tennessee because the ice never made it this far down south during the Pleistocene. But you see them throughout New England, um, New York, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Montana even down to Utah and um, a little bit into Idaho. So you could see that that's how we know how f that the ice used to cover up much more of the planet. Bottom line is that the present moment ice covers 10 percent, glaciers cover 10 percent of the Earth's land surface. But during the peak of the Pleistocene epoch up to 30 percent of the land surface on planet Earth was covered by ice. Clearly indicates that during the Pleistocene it was colder. And this is going to have a lot of effects on the evolution of life as life e evolved, as we'll see in the next chapter, to adapt to the cold weather. There's basically, basically two kinds of glaciers. You either have valley glaciers where you have these rivers of ice, like up in Canada and uh, in Russia and Norway and you, where you have these valley glaciers, you can still see the, the bare rock above the ice. But there's also something called an ice sheet. And ice sheets exist in only two places, places today, Antarctica and Greenland. Let's take a look and see what it looks like in Antarctica and Greenland. Ice sheets are what we find in Greenland and Antarctica where everything is covered by ice. The land does not stick above the ice. And so Antarctica and Greenland are almost entirely covered by an ice sheet where everything is covered by ice. Another thing about the Cenozoic era that you want to bear in mind is that Volcanism continued along our Pacific Northwest coast, going all the way from Northern California through Oregon, past Portland, past Seattle, through Washington, and even into the southwestern province of Canada, British Columbia, with Mount Garibaldi up here near Vancouver. So all these mountains you should know are called the what mountain range? the Cascade Mountain Range. And the Cascade Mountain Range was primarily formed during what era? What's the last era of geologic history? Era. The Cenozoic Era. Do, so, let's say someone were to ask you, your little brother, your little sister were to ask you, what formed the Cascade Mountains? You should know by now 
its subduction along our Pacific Northwest coast through the what plate? The Juan de Fuca plate. So there's a deep ocean trench off of our Pacific Northwest where subduction, subduction continues today. Since subduction continues today off of our Pacific Northwest coast, these volcanoes, the Cascades, are still active. They're not extinct. In fact, the U.S. Geological Survey has volcanologists monitoring Mount St. Helens, Mount Hood. Last time Mount St. Helens erupted was back in 1980. We're getting ready for it to, er, to erupt again. And we know it's going to erupt again because subduction continues along our Pacific Northwest coast. Another Cenozoic feature is the Yellowstone caldera. What is a caldera? C-A-L-D-E-R-A. -E well, let's take a look here. Caldera, another geology word, is a big crater like like the ones you see here. Here's Crater Lake in out west in Oregon. This crater was formed by the collapse of a volcano. There was a cold in order to form a caldera, ladies and gentlemen, you had to have a what we call a, a composite volcano, an explosive Volcano such as Mount Fuji or Mount St. Helens or Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines or Mount Vesuvius in Italy. And, and these explosive eruptions are so violent they can cause the entire volcano, the entire composite volcano to collapse and just form a big crater. That's what a caldera is formed from. The collapse of a, vi of a volcano called a composite volcano from an explosive vi violent volcanic eruption. So bottom line is this whole area here in, around Yellowstone was formed by these three calderas, three explosive volcanic eruptions that left behind these three big craters. What causes this to occur? Well, imagine that you know first of all that Yellowstone Park in Wyoming is on the North American plate. And beneath the North American plate, there's a sp spot in, in the mantle called a hot spot because it's a very high temperature. There's a lot of radioactive isotopes decaying in the mantle beneath the North American plate, beneath the Yellowstone caldera. You also know that the continents move even though that spot in the mantle is stationary. So as the continents move, you get another violent volca volcanic eruption forming a caldera, and then it shifts to another spot as the continent moves again and continues to do that so. So why do we find all of these hot springs in Yellowstone? It's because it's, Yellowstone is still underneath that hot spot. Let's take a look and see what the Yellowstone hot springs look like. Once again, don't forget these are Cenozoic in age. So when you go out west, you're going to see these boiling pools of water. Some of them as high as 300 degrees Celsius, um, more than 500 degrees Fahrenheit. And they have all these colors in them. Those are from microorganisms that belong to domain archaea. So there's all kinds of little microbes that are living in this hot water that actually have adapted to that hot water. But when you're a scientist, you always think in the back of your mind, why? Why is the water so hot here under Yellowstone? It's because of the hot spot that exists underneath Yellowstone. Now, I think that tells you something else, if you think about it. And I'm sure you, your friends or you might have seen it on the Internet or in a movie, that there will be another violent volcanic eruption in Yellowstone at some point in time. We just don't know when it's going to occur and it's going to make another caldera. But this whole Yellowstone area, that, uh, these hot springs, um, you can see these people here. When you go out there, they always tell kids don't get near these hot pools of water because it'll kill you. I mean, it's so hot. And once in a while, you have a, you had a kid that once who uh, went into one of these and just um, you basically 
you're instantly dead. You don't want to get near that. Always watch your kids when you become a mother or father. Don't let them get near these. The Yellowstone Caldera area formed during what era of geologic time? A. Paleozoic. B. Cenozoic. C. Mesozoic. Well, everything in this chapter is about what era? The Cenozoic era that goes from 65 million years ago till now. Take a look here at the world as we now know it. This is what our planet looks like at the, at the moment, as far as the continents go. But this is Pleistocene paleogeography. That's what it says up here. So what they're showing you here is what parts of the world today have evidence of glacial ice during the Pleistocene from 2.6 million years ago to 10,700 years ago. So we can see that during the Pleistocene, the ice moved all the way down here to Iowa and to, believe it or not, close to Mexico down here and into New England and Ohio and the Midwest. They also covered up Britain and much of Germany was covered up by glacial ice. At the present time, the ice is only up here. So during the Pleistocene, conditions were colder. Since conditions were colder during the Pleistocene, do you think that we had a transgression or a regression occurring during the Pleistocene? If more of the Earth's seawater was stored in ice, do you think sea level would have been lower or higher during the Pleistocene? Sea level would have been lower so that you could have walked 100 miles off the coast of North Carolina today and still be on land. You could have walked 100 miles off of New York City and still be on land because sea level was lower. We had a regression during the Pleistocene. And the thing you want to remember is when people talk about climate change in the news, they're talking about cycles that have, um, uh, that have been occurring for, for billions of years Sometimes the earth gets warmer. When the earth gets warmer, the glaciers melt. Sea level rises, and we get transgressions so that the ocean moves onto the land, sometimes covering up the continents with those epiric seas we talked about earlier on. That's usually when most of the deposition occurs. Then, when we have ice ages, sea level retreats, and from uh, and so the land extends further out to the sea and we call that a regression when sea level drops it indicates global cooling when sea level rises it's global warming global warming makes transgressions global cooling makes regressions during the pleistocene we had global cooling so we had a regression Here you can see um, how cl climate has changed. And the, for, the, here you get your typical bivariate diagram that scientists love so much. The y-axis and the x-axis. And here you have today at zero years, 10 million years ago, 20 million years ago, all the way to the beginning of the Cenozoic, 65 million years ago. And also on the bottom we have are epochs, Holocene, Pleistocene, Pleistocene, Miocene, Oligocene, Eocene, and Paleocene. This is the first epoch of the Cenozoic right here. Using pollen, because pollen, um, certain types of pollen are common when there's global cooling, and the certain types are common during global warming, and also using uh, isotopes, we, we, can, we can calculate the temperature of the past without getting into all the chemistry here because this is an introductory geology class uh, just uh, take my word for it these isotopes and the, and the pollen tells us that as you at the beginning of the Cenozoic it was a lot warmer and you can see the temperature goes up and down and up and down but during the Pleistocene you could clearly see that conditions became colder we can drill into the ice of Antarctica and look at 
ice that's 10 million years old, 20 million years old, and look at the chemistry of the ice and the pollen in the ice and figure out during what periods of our time were we experiencing global warming, as you can see some warming occurred right here, and global cooling, as we can see when this red curve goes down here. Notice right here at the end, it starts to get cold, and then it would go back up. Right now, what are people worried about? Global warming and sea level rising. Especially the island nations are worried about that. Places where um, they're right at sea level, they're going to be underwater if the earth continues to warm up. And cities like New Orleans and Baltimore, they're going to be underwater if the global warming continues. And so we have had these natural cycles of Earth warming up and cooling down. We can see that in the estimated temperatures based on pollen and radioactive isotopes. So why are people so worried today about climate change? It's because of carbon dioxide and methane, which are greenhouse gases. And they're like the glass on top of a greenhouse. So basically, solar radiation from the sun penetrates through our atmosphere, warms up the surface of the earth, and that heat is sent back into outer space. But if you have greenhouse gases like CO2 and methane, then that blocks the heat from escaping to outer space and sends most of it back to the earth. CO2 is what most people are worried about. CO2, carbon dioxide, is affected by mankind, by human activity. Fossil fuels, oil, natural gas, and coal, when you burn them, you add CO2 into the atmosphere. What takes CO2 out of the atmosphere? Trees. We have less trees now than back during George Washington's time. So we're removing less CO2. But since the Industrial Revolution in the 1850s, we burned trillions of tons of oil, natural gas, and coal, which is adding a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. And that's causing the Earth to warm up. And I know you have extremists on both ends of the political spectrum um, regarding this climate change. I, on the extreme right, you have people who say there is no such thing as climate change and uh, we can just keep on burning fossil fuels and uh, it's just a natural cycle. I, I tell you, no scientist, even the most conservative, believe that. We have had an effect by cutting down too many trees and burning fossil fuels. And so those on the extreme right want to ignore climate change. Um, that is very dangerous because the earth is warming up too fast. But on the extreme left, you also have extremists who say, let's not burn any oil, natural gas, or coal and just go on to green energy. We, that, that would be a good idea, it, and we should do that. But we can't do that all at once. We have to do it gradually. Otherwise, our economy is going to collapse. Um, recently, there was this big problem in Texas, uh, and they didn't have enough. Um, they didn't use natural gas. They relied on wind energy. And, and so people's electricity bills were a couple thousand dollars a m or even up to $15,000 for a month. Because the wind and solar, you can't depend on it always. You have to have some fossil fuel backup. So I always think that the people in the middle are more rational. We have to use some fossil fuels now. We can't ban gasoline. We can't, if we stop all of our drilling of oil and natural gas and coal, it's going to, all those people are going to lose their jobs and we're going to be dependent on foreign sources of energy. If we ignore climate change, it's also not a good thing. We have to do it in a reasonable middle. There's a middle ground is what I'm trying to say. So if you take a look at pollen, 
and pollen is, as you know, sperm, because plants are sexual organisms, they tell us when the earth was warm and when the earth is cold. And they tell us that the earth has experienced climate change since the very beginning of time. Global warming sometimes, global cooling, global warming, cooling. So part of this global warming that has been occurring over the last 10,700 years is part of a natural cycle. But part of it is also due to burning fossil fuels and um, cutting down too many trees. So we don't want, to, uh, it's not good for the world to cut down our forests anyway and have all these species become extinct. And one of the things I love about Tennessee is that we have trees and, and clean water and nature. And growing up in New Jersey, uh, we, my sister and I would have to walk for miles just to see this little pond we call the magic pond because it was the only pond that existed. Everything was com covered with concrete. We don't want it, the whole world to look like New Jersey where there's no, no, nothing of nature left behind. Nature is beautiful. Here you can see um, how glaciers move. And you know, this is a valley glacier, and uh, the the glaciers um, have what we call a zone of accumulation and a zone of wastage. And this is the edge of the glacier, which we sometimes call the snout of the glacier. Out of the snout of the glacier, are all the these streams, which we call braided streams, because they kind of look like braids in the person's hair. The water is very shallow and moves out in all different directions. As the ice melts here at the edge of the glacier, at the snout of the glacier, in the zone of accumulation, the the valley glacier is bright, powdery white. Why? Because in the zone of accumulation, as the name implies, more snow falls during the winter than than melts during the summer. So snow accumulates in the zone of accumulation. The zone of wastage is a part, you find this gray melting snow and ice because more snow in the zone of wastage melts during the summer than falls during the winter. And the line between this, this lot, dashed line here, they didn't put it in here, right here is called the snow line. The snow line is the pla separates the zone of accumulation from the zone of wastage. If global warming is occurring, then the snow lines of the world should be moving upslope, shouldn't they? If global cooling is occurring, the snow lines of the world should move, be moving downslope. I tell you what. Look at all the old National Geographic magazines from the 1920s. The snow lines of the world used to be a lot further downslope. And they're moving upslope, ladies and gentlemen. The earth really is warming up very quickly. And we have to do something about it. We have to reduce our consumption of uh, our, our burning of fossil fuels. And um, we can do that in a variety of different ways. Um, one way we could do is energy conservation uh, by driving more fuel-efficient vehicles, by using mass transit, um, taking the train instead of driving. I know we can't do that in Tennessee, but most states in the United States, you don't need to drive a car. My sister um, in Philadelphia hasn't driven a car in 30 years. She takes a train everywhere. Um, there are ways which we can conserve energy. And then if we are going to burn fossil fuels, there are ways of um, maybe collecting some of that CO2. And But obviously green energy is the future. But at the moment, we can't move to it too fast because if we do, our economy will, will collapse. There's no way to sustain it. Solar and wind uh, at the moment are a lot more expensive than fossil fuels. That's the basic problem. And, and, and the 
200 pound gorilla in the well the 2000 pound gorilla in the room is what there is only one affordable way of using less fossil fuels and that's nuclear power nobody wants to talk about that republicans democrats don't want to talk about that but you know what nuclear power people are scared of it because of Fukushima and Three Mile Island and Chernobyl and there are risks in using nuclear power but guess what the, the new nuclear power plants for example in France produce 70 percent of their electricity and not one person has died why because the nuclear reactors are built so they cannot melt down all the these disasters of the past were built with reactors where there could be a meltdown so that really is the solution but people don't want to talk about it unfortunately and it um, the rest of the world they're using nuclear power they're releasing less carbon it creates jobs and it can be done safely anyway that's just my opinion and whatever your opinion is I respect it too uh, we'll talk more um, let's see show you no more oh, yeah, so, the, so the Antarctica is melting uh, Greenland is melting some of the coastal cities could disappear if sea levels continue to rise even just a few meters which is a few yards basically a meter is 39 inches as you might recall and um, I think that's enough for this week so uh, next week we'll have another round of videos and I hope you have a, a wonderful week